Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the uh, virtual ICM room two. Um, this is the second talk uh, this afternoon, uh, coming from uh, section three, number theory. Uh, my name is Witek Gunn from the National University of Singapore, and I'll be moderating uh, this talk. Our speaker today uh, is uh, Professor Dimitri Kokolopoulos from Université de Montréal. And the title of his talk is Rational Approximation of Irrational Numbers. Professor Kokolopoulos is uh, an expert in uh, analytic number theory. He obtained his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2010 and has since been at Université de Montréal, where he currently holds uh, the Kutua Chair in Fundamental Research. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Kokolopoulos to deliver his talk, Rational Approximations of Irrational Numbers. Welcome to my talk. It is a tremendous honor to be invited to speak at the 2022 ICM. As you know, this event was supposed to take place in Russia, but due to the invasion of Ukraine has now been moved online. My thoughts are with the people of Ukraine who have to suffer from this unjust war. I will speak about my joint work with James Maynard on rational approximations of irrational numbers. Here is the question we shall study. We're given some irrational number x, and we want to find fractions say over q that approximate it well. What do we mean by that? Well, firstly, the error should, of course, be as small as possible, while at the same time, having our fraction a over q being as simple as possible. And the typical way to measure this, uh, the complexity of the fraction is by measuring how large its denominator q is. Moreover, we often require q to lie in some special set of denominators, for example, prime numbers or squares. And this aspect will be particularly important for the purpose of the stock, as we will see later on. The result that starts the entire the model theory of the final approximation, as it's called sometimes, or rational approximation, is Dirichlet's theorem, which shows that for every irrational x, we have infinitely many approximations, rational approximations that do better than one over the denominator squared. Of course, given this result, it is natural to wonder whether we can improve it. And uh, these are two of the main guiding uh, questions of the field. Firstly, can we replace one over q squared by something smaller? Secondly, what about restricting q to some special set of integers? Can we say something about that? About the first question, uh, a related quantity in a natural way uh, to approach it is to define this quantity called the, irras the, irras the irrationality measure. So for every x, we define mu of x to be the largest exponent e, such that x has infinitely many approximations that do better than one of the denominator to this exponent e. So for example, Dirichlet's theorem right away implies that mu of x is at least 2 for every rational x. And Roth, in 1955, proved his famous theorem that every algebraic irrational x has irrationality measure exactly equal to 2. This is not so, easy, not so, this is not so hard to prove for uh, quadratic irrationals using the theory of continued fractions, but it's much harder and more, much more profound for general algebraic irrationals x, and one of the main reasons why Roth won his fields method. What about transcendental numbers? For example, let's take pi, arguably the most famous one. Childberger and Zudilin proved that the irrationality measure of pi is at most 7.1, a little bit bigger than that, improving on uh, various other results before them. And of course, we also know that it's at least 2 from Dirichlet's theorem. But as you can see, there is a pretty big gap between this upper bound and the lower bound. What is the actual irrationality measure of pi? We don't know. We do believe it's equal to 2, but we, we can't really prove this for now. Let us now turn to the second question uh, of restricting the denominators to lie in some special set. Uh, about square denominators, we have the following theorem of Zaharescu that proved that um, for every rational x, we have infinitely many fractions with square denominators that do better than 1 over the denominator to the 4 thirds. A little bit bigger, smaller than that. And the same result is also known by, uh, for prime numbers, for prime denominators, by work of Matomaki. So she also proved 1 over the denominator of the 4 thirds with prime denominator. And of course, uh, the natural question is, can we, is this the best we can do or can we improve them? And the natural conjecture is to replace 4 thirds by 3 halves for Zaharescu's theorem and uh, 4 thirds by 2 in Matomaki's theorem. And the reason why primes, uh, we have a smaller exponent for squares than for primes is because squares are sparser 
and therefore we don't have as many fractions to work with. So we cannot get as close to irrationals as with prime denominators. Prime denominators are basically as sparse as the integers, up, up to factors of x to the epsilon at least. And so we can we hope to be able to do as, at least as, as well as um, Dirichlet's theorem, or as well as Dirichlet's theorem. And um, I should say that both of these problems are very hard to, to, to prove. And in particular, the problem about primes uh, lies beyond uh, the grasp of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. OK, so in the final approximation, uh, we have a fixed irrational x, uh, which we would like to approximate. And we see right away that we are related to very hard open problems. For example, what is the irrationality measure of pi? We don't know. How well can we approximate a fixed irrational number x using square denominators or prime denominators? We also don't know. Uh, so this is where the metric defined approximation enters the picture. In this field, we assume a more statistical point of view, and we say, okay, what if we are allowed to only prove for mo on average or for most uh, numbers that something is true, for most irrationals? So what, what is going on here is that we have some fixed measure, let, typically the Lebesgue measure, as will always be the case for this talk, and then we're allowed to throw away a set of exceptions of measure zero. And this allows us to exclude uh, some small pathological sets and uh, therefore allows us to prove very simple to state and very general results at the same time. And we will see examples uh, throughout the talk. Um, and so here is the main setup. Okay, so we're shifting our attention from a fixed x to the set of x's that are approximable under some constraints. These constraints are captured by this sequence of permissible errors, delta 1, delta 2, etc. Um, and notice that I have uh, restricted my attention between 0 and 1, and this is because if this inequality down here has implementing solutions for x, so does for x plus 1 and x plus 2, etc. So because of this one periodicity, I just look inside 0, 1. Moreover, notice that I'm uh, allowing my errors delta q to vanish occasionally. And if they do, this means that this inequality has no solution, so I cannot use fractions of denominator q. Therefore, this general notation captures both questions I asked before uh, about both improving the error of Dirichlet's theorem and also restricting the support using only uh, certain denominators. The result that uh, sort of sets uh, the picture of the entire subject, uh, of the entire subject of the metric definite approximation is due to Hinchin from 1924. Hinchin showed this very beautiful zero-one law. He said, okay, let's look at the series Q delta Q. And if the series converges, then he proved that the Lebesgue measure of A, M of A denotes the Lebesgue measure, is zero. On the other hand, if the series diverges, then we have allowed enough flexibility in our errors, and we have captured almost all uh, real numbers X with, this, with our constraints. We do need this technical condition Q squared delta Q that is very important, and we'll come back to it. The result of Hinchin is actually secretly a probabilistic result, and this is the right framework in which to view it. So here um, is the related probability result due to Borelli-Cantelli. So we have the first Borelli-Cantelli lemma that says the following. So here we have some events E1, E2, etc. And we want to understand whether if many of them occur or finally many of them occur. And Borelli-Cantelli, the first Borelli-Cantelli lemma says that if the sum of the probabilities is finite, then almost surely only finally many of the EJs occur. Whereas if the EJs are, uh, so if the sum of the probabilities of the EJs diverges, and importantly, very importantly, the EJs are independent of each other, then the, almost surely, infinitely many of the EJs will occur. So this is very analogous to the situation here. Uh, if we assume that to every denominator Q, we associate the event AQ. And what is AQ? The set of X's that can be approximated by a fraction of denominator, denominator Q with, uh, at most, with error at most delta Q. And uh, the probability space is 0, 1, equipped with the Lebesgue measure uh, M. OK, so um, yeah, so if I, I just calculate the Lebesgue measure of AQ, I just get 2 times Q delta Q. So you see directly the analogy uh, between Borel-Catelli and Hinchin. The first Borel-Catelli lemma actually implies directly the first part of Hinchin's theorem. So from this point of view, I can view uh, the second part of Hinchin's theorem as saying that the, quantity, sorry, the condition Q squared delta Q uh, decreases guarantees enough approximate independence between the events AQ so that um, we still have a full measure, as if the events were completely independent. Okay, so um, of course, Hinge's theorem um, 
you see this and right away you, you, you start wondering, can I remove this condition Q squared delta Q uh, goes to zero or, or decreases, sorry. And this is exactly what Daphne Schaeffer um, proved in, uh, sorry, undertook the question that Daphne Schaeffer undertook in 1941. And firstly, they proved various uh, generalizations or extensions of Hitchin's theorem without this condition or by replacing it by other conditions. But importantly, they also show that you cannot just remove it completely and expect the theorem to hold, the second part. So they constructed a, a, an explicit um, example, an explicit uh, example of uh, errors, delta 1, delta 2, etc., for which the series Q delta Q diverges, and yet we can only approximate finitely, so Lebesgue measure 0 uh, of a rational uh, of um, numbers x. And here is how their construction works. Notice that we have not said anything about reducing our fractions. Therefore, it means that I can use my fraction one-third also as the fraction 5 over 15 and one-fifth as the fraction 3 over 15 etc. So if I set up my errors delta 3, delta 5, and delta 15 to be all equal to each other, then I have that the events A3 and A5 are completely contained inside A15. And this creates very strong correlations and makes some events redundant. And uh, this is why the... Morel can tell it doesn't, the, the second part of Hintz cannot be generalized fully. So by taking this uh, idea and uh, uh, they, by taking this idea, Duffin and Schaeffer constructed the counterexample. Okay, so given this counterexample, the next natural question is, okay, what if I don't allow repetitions? Does this then guarantee enough approximate independence between my events so that I get um, the full zero one law without any other assumptions? So this is what the Daphne and Schaeffer did. They said, now, okay, let's look at A star instead of A, where I'm only allowing reduced fractions A over Q to approximate X with the same uh, target error delta Q. And then they conjectured that, yes, we do have the full 0, 1 law without any other assumptions. Notice that our events here, A Q star, the corresponding ones without the if often, just for fixed Q, to have approximations A over Q with A and Q co-prime. And uh, the probability is 2 phi Q delta Q, where phi Q is uh, the Euler function that counts, the Euler torsion function that counts how many reduced energies I have mod Q. So this is the natural series to consider in this problem because this is the, the sum of the probabilities. And the main point of my talk is to prove this conjecture or to explain the proof of this conjecture jointly with James Maynard from 2019, uh, published in 2020. Between our work and the Daphne Schaeffer conjecture, there was a lot of um, other people that worked on the problem. And I will uh, mention some of this work later on in my talk because it has played a very important role in our proof. Let me now try and explain some of the main ideas that go into the proof of the Duffy Schaeffer conjecture. What we're trying to do here is to prove the second borel cantelli lemma without knowing, without having the assumption of independence. Here are the events we're working with. For every denominator Q, I have the event AQ star, which is the set of reals between 0 and 1 that admit an approximation with a reduced fraction of denominator Q and error delta Q. <clears throat> the problem, of course, is that we don't know that our events are independent. Um, so how do we prove that if the sum of the probabilities, which is just the sum of the Lebesgue measures here, um, if this summation diverges, how do we prove that if many of them occur really often? Well, Paley, use, using the cauchy schwarz inequality, showed that uh, you don't actually need to have full independence between the AQ stars to prove the borel cantelli lemma or the conclusion of it. All, all, all you need to do is to have control on pairwise correlations. So what do we mean by that? I look at two events, AQ and AR star, and I consider the probability that they both occur at the same time. Of course, if the events were independent, this would exactly equal the product of, a, of the probabilities. But you don't need to know exact equality. All you need to know is that an inequality occurs with the right constant. And you don't even need to know this for every fixed pair QR of this thing QR, but only for most of them, so only on average. <clears throat> okay, so this Proving this inequality on average with the right constant here, or very close to the right constant, is enough to show um, the borel cantelli lemma, so the duffy schaeffer conjecture. Okay, as an important simplification, 
um, comes from work of Gallagher. So Gallagher in 1961 proved the following. He proved that uh, the measure of A star is always zero or one. And he did this uh, using a very clever ergodic theoretic argument that built on earlier work of uh, Cassels. Cassels treated the case of A instead of A star. So this is a very important result for us because it allows us to simplify a lot um, uh, the proof in a, in, an important, in a technical but important way. What does, why? What does Gallagher allow you to do? Instead of um, showing that A star is one, you just need to show that um, the measure of A star is positive. So let's say we want to prove that the measure of A star is bigger than 1 over 10 to the 10 to the 10. Then what I need to do is to prove this inequality for most pairs, um, distinct, uh, pairs with distinct QR. And not with a constant 1 here, but with a constant 10 to the 10 to the 10. And, in general, and, and likewise for other constants here, and one can put. So um, this allows for a lot more flexibility in the argument and simplifies a lot uh, the proof. Okay, so the second important ingredient comes from work of Polyton and Vaughan, who built on previous work of uh, Erdos and Valer. So Polyton and Vaughan, in 1990, proved the following thing. So what they did was to consider uh, this relation and basically understand exactly when it fails or holds. So let me call this condition star here. What uh, Polyton and Vaughan showed that if star fails, then two things must happen. The first one is that um, QR, or rather QR over the GCD squared, must have lots of small prime factors. And not just lots, but really abnormally uh, many. Okay, uh, I will not quantify this further because it gets a bit too technical, but uh, this is a condition that doesn't happen too often. And the second one is that the GCD of Q and R must be big. <clears throat> this condition too is a little bit too technical in generality. So in order to clarify a bit the ideas, uh, let me consider a specific example uh, under which this condition becomes much simpler and um, will allow me to explain in a much clearer way the main ideas uh, in, the, in the proof of the Darwin Schaffer conjecture. Okay, so how do we, what, is this, what does this condition look like in a specific example, which is the following one? Okay, so here is uh, what we do. We fix some set of denominators, let's call it S, that lies in some dyadic block X to X. And we also fix uh, some parameter that is associated to this set, C. Uh, this set S will have cardinality about X to the C, but because here um, well, I'm not going with Q but with phi Q, uh, I will have weighted cardinality for reasons I will explain momentarily. Okay, so phi Q over Q is very close to one on average, bound it being, uh, it behaves like a constant on average, so really one can think of this, morally speaking, as saying that S has about X to the C elements. <clears throat> okay, now when C is small, um, S gets quite sparse, and to counterbalance this, I associate to, uh, it's Q in S, this error, that, be, that the sort of uh, in, you know, completely counterbalances the potential sparseness, sparseness of S. And I will just set delta Q to be zero outside of S. I'm not going to work with denominators other, uh, in other, for other edges in this dyadic block. And then um, when you do that, uh, and you look at the corresponding, at uh, the part of this uh, summation here for things in S, 
then you get that uh, it gives about one. And this is because Q is of size about X in this dyadic block. Okay, so uh, of course this is a finite set of denominators, and in the duffin cipher conjecture we're really working with an infinite one. But imagine that our set of denominators consists of infinitely many such dyadic uh, parts that are very, very uh, far one from each other. And then, because they're so far away, they will not really interact with each other, the denominators. So all the action is really happening in each individual block. And what you need to show that it's in each individual block, you're really capturing uh, some uh, at least positive proportion of real numbers. So what you, we would need to do to prove the Duffy cipher conjecture is to show that um, uh, the measure of the AQ stars over Q in S is at least uh, bounded from below uniformly, bounded away from zero. So this means some uniform constant, let's say 1 over 10 to the 10 to the 10. So if I can do this, then I'm showing that A star has a um, positive measure on the way from 0, and by Gallagher 0, 1 low, I can then prove that uh, it has actually measure 1. Okay, so um, how do we do this? Well, as I explained, um, we need to exploit uh, these conditions 1 and 2 of Polyton and Vol. Uh, and let me now, as promised, um, explain what happens to 2 in this simplified uh, setup. So 2 of polygon and von uh, becomes the following condition. It becomes a condition that the GCD of Q and R is at least x to the 1 minus C. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's try and understand these two conditions and what they say. So let me first consider the case is one because it's a bit simpler. And why is that? It's because when C is one, this condition actually becomes vacuous. It doesn't say anything. It's automatically satisfied. Therefore, really what Polygon and Von say is only the first one, that QR has many prime, has too many, uh, sorry, QR over the GCD of QR squared has too many small prime factors. Okay, but then um, I can, what do I know about this condition? Well, I know that this condition does not happen too often. So I know that one fails uh, or rather holds only for um, zero percentage of generic pairs QR in X to X. So if you take a typical pair of um, integers QR in between in this dyadic block, then uh, actually this will not hold. And if this doesn't hold, then star holds. So we're in, we're in good shape for generic uh, pairs, meaning using them uniformly at random. But notice here that C is one, therefore S is about has a size about X, which is exactly the number of uh, integers between X and two X. This means that when C is one, I'm working with a positive density set of integers, and therefore I can view my denominators as basically as generic integers. And uh, in particular, I can use this statement here to show that also uh, one holds only for 0% of pairs QR in S times S. And then, what does this mean? It means that for most pairs QR in S times S, star holds, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So this proves the duffin schaffer conjecture when C is 1. And this is the argument of Erdos and Waller from the 70s who proved exactly, basically, this special case of the duffin cipher conjecture. What about now when C is less than 1? Well, in this case, um, of course, we can still use 1 in the same fashion, but it's not enough. And why is it enough? It's because C then gets very sparse when C is less than 1. And the savings obtained by 1 are not enough to counteract the sparseness of S. Therefore, we really need to exploit condition number 2 in this case. Uh, or rather this more explicit version of it here. Okay, let us... Um, the problem, right, so the problem is that S is very sparse and we don't know anything else about it. Only, the only thing we know is that it contains about X to the C integers. We don't know these integers behave like typical integers between X and 2, 2X. They might be all very weird integers between X and 2X, for which this happens uh, with very high probability. But if we knew that S was structured somehow, uh, then uh, we would be able to exploit one and we would be in business. Um, 
Well, what do we mean by structure? What, um, what kind of um, set would be a good uh, candidate to work with? Well, let's think about this condition here, the GCD of Q and R being bigger than X to the R minus C for many pairs Q R. There is actually an easy way to construct an S for which this holds for every pair Q R. And what is this uh, way? So we fix some D of size about X to the 1 minus C. And what we consider is a set of multiples of it. So we take D times N with, one M, li with M lying between X over D and 2X over D. Okay. And of course, any pair um, QR from S prime will satisfy this condition. Okay, so if um, how many pairs does S prime have? How many elements? Well, notice that the M is a size about X over D. Uh, so, um, and, uh, so the set of uh, elements in S prime is about X over D, but D is about X to the 1 minus C, so the number of elements of S prime is about X to the C. Therefore, S prime is actually a candidate for S. And if this was actual, the actual um, uh, set S, or a positive proportion of it, then we would be in very good shape. And the reason is, this is a very structured set, very easy to, to work with, and in particular, a set for which uh, we can really exploit very well condition 1. Uh, notice that condition 1, uh, if I divide through by common factors, it remains, it sort of, it rescales very nicely. If I take Q to be D times N, and R to be D times N, then I get that um, QR over the GCD of them squared is just MN over the, their GCD squared. So, um, we, right away we get, um, yeah, so we, we, we look at the set of M's now, we just recalibrate everything dividing through by our common divisor, and we get a set of M's that discuss a positive density between 1 and X to the C, and for which we know that 1 holds. But we know that, um, and for which we, we then have uh, the corresponding one, uh, the corresponding one condition. But we know that one cannot hold for too many such M's, uh, such, uh, pair, uh, such pairs, and therefore we're, we're done, because then we show that for S prime, uh, for most pairs of denominators, star holds, and um, this proves the duffy cipher conjecture. Okay, so this is the good case when S is really very well structured, like, and it looks like S prime. What about in general? Well, in general, we have two cases. Uh, either um, star, or rather this condition, uh, let's call it two, either this condition holds for very few pairs, and this is very good because then uh, star will hold for almost all pairs. Or we have two holding for a positive proportion of pairs, and this is the, 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 the hard case to deal with. And what um, the main idea behind the proof of the Duffy Schaeffer conjecture is to show that if you have the GCD of QRs, uh, Q and R being this big for many pairs, that this implies structure, meaning that it forces S to basically look like S prime, or to at least have a positive proportion of S prime inside it. This is the main idea. So if we can prove this kind of structure theorem, then we're done because then we can transfer our set ourselves to S prime and then exploit one, and uh, just like we did in the case is one, and complete the proof. Let me sum up the previous discussion. We have the following model problem that guides the entire analysis and the proof of the Duffin Schaeffer conjecture. We're given a set of denominators S between X to X. And let's say we have about X over D of them. And let us also assume that we, we have too many correlations between the pairs. The condition two of holding the one holds too often. What does this mean? It means that in the GCD of Q and R is bigger than D for at least 1% of pairs QR in S times S. And with the previous notation, D is about X to the 1 minus C. Does this then mean that there must be some fixed divisor D bigger than D that divides a positive proportion of elements of S? If this is the case, then we're done because we have, very we have found a very good structure inside S, and we can use this structure, uh, we can use this structure subpart uh, sub of S on, on which we can exploit condition 1 and complete the proof of the duffy cipher conjecture. So this is the goal. And in order to um, try and solve this problem, prove that this is indeed the case, we assume um, a graph theory point of view, because this helps us visualize the problem very well. So here is a particular example to illustrate the idea. 
we have uh, uh, the vertices of our graph will be the denominators. So let's say we have denominators 11, 55, 20, etc. And the edges of our graph, um, of our GCD graph as we call it, uh, we are, okay, so we connect to pairs exactly where the GCD, the GCD is large enough. So bigger than the threshold we have set. So here I just took D to be one for the sake of exposition, but imagine you have some other value of D. Okay, so what is the main, the, the philosophy is that if this graph is highly connected, it has positive proportion of the total number of edges you can have, then the, it, can, it must have a very structured component. Okay, so you can see here that I put a blue line, a blue edge between 11 and 55 because the, the GCD is 11. And I put a red edge between 55 and 10 because the GCD is 5. And so red edges mean uh, GCD 5, uh, blue edges mean GCD 11, etc. And you can see that there is a very large monochromatic subgraph uh, that is complete. And this is all the edges that are divisible by 5, we have, where we have a, our fixed divisor. So this is the philosophy. You start with a highly connected general graph, a GCD graph, and uh, the idea is to try and locate this monochromatic uh, subgraph that is structured. And everything is, um, the GCDs are occurred due to a fixed divisor. If we can do this, we're done. And of course, the, the, the question now becomes, how do you actually locate this subgraph? How do we prune away all these other parts? How do we decide which parts to, to prune away and start zeroing into this nicely, to this nice uh, structure subgraph? Okay, so we do this in an iterative way where we go prime by prime. So we start, let's say, with the prime 11, and we're going to decide whether we keep this part or this part. Of course, we should be keeping the large part, etc. So let me explain this idea uh, step by step. Okay, so we have this iterative compression algorithm. What do we mean by that? So we, um, for simplicity, I will assume my denominators S are all square free. And a slight complication compared to the image I just showed you is that I must actually assume a bipartite point of view. So this, the graph I start with, the, the, I set up there, I actually view it as a bipartite graph where I have the denominators on the left and on the right and then I put the edges in between them. And then later I will be focusing potentially on different parts of the left and of the right. Okay, so what you do then is to construct to this pruning process is done in an iterative way where I go from G0 to G1 to G2, etc. At every step of the way, I'm going to uh, require new information about with respect to a new prime. So in G0, I don't really know anything, but in G1, I will know whether my vertices are divisible or not divisible by P, etc. Uh, and they will have the same divisibility. I will explain this more concretely. And then when we end, uh, we end with our last graph, let's say GJ, then we have full information. What do we mean by that? Let's say that the uh, edges on the left, the, sorry, the vertices on the left are S prime, the ones on the right are T prime, and the edges E prime. So what do we need by full? We need by full information. Well, we will know that for all um, all elements of S prime are divisible by some fixed divisor uh, A. We will also know similarly that all edges of all elements of T prime are divisible by some fixed B. And we will also know that this A and B completely determine uh, the GCD structure. So for every QR in Q prime, the GCD of QR is equal to the GCD of AB. So really we have complete information here. And assuming there is at least one edge, I can guarantee this is bigger than D. Okay, so this is the goal, to construct this end graph. <clears throat> Assume we can do this for now. What can I say about this end graph? Well, in this end graph, I have full information, I have a very structured set. So for G GJ, I can exploit... Um, in GJ, uh, one can be exploited. Condition one of Poisson von can be exploited. So when I exploit, it, I exploit this, it gives me some bound on the edges. On the number of edges of E prime. Uh, <coughs> right. 
What the, but okay, so what you're gonna say? What, what we really need to know is uh, how many edges you have in G0 because these are the pairs of denominators QR that are strongly correlated and we wanna show that these pairs are not too many. So in order to be able to transfer this information from GJ, from the edge set of GJ all the way in the beginning, I must, have, I must make sure that at every step of the way, the uh, edge set of G1 tells me something about the edge set of G0 and etc. for every step. Okay, so how do we do this? So we, uh, we, we adapt an argument, an idea of Roth, um, called the density increment argument from additive combinatorics. We cannot quite work with densities, uh, edge densities, because what we really need to know is the number of edges. We need to control the number of edges, not just the edge uh, density. So well, we come up with some other quality, uh, quantity that we call the quality of the graph that captures some important invariance of its graph that we'll explain um, uh, in a while. Uh, so, and what we need to, to do is to do a quality increment argument. Where you start with the quality Q uh, of your initial graph, and then it always increases. Till you reach the last one. So here, this can be bounded by anatomy. Meaning condition one of polygon von. I can exploit my bound on the edge set by anatomy and um, bound this. And on the other hand, this is related to, this is somehow quite well related to the number of edges I have started with. So therefore, if I can carry out such an argument, um, then I'm done because uh, I bound the end graph and it actually tells me something for the, the graph I started with. Okay, so how do we actually do this and what is this quality? In order to explain what the quality looks like, uh, I first need to explain the inductive argument. Okay, so how do you actually construct the next, uh, go from G1 to G2, etc.? So let's assume we have uh, arrived at GJ minus 1. And let's say we have left, left vertex set V, right W, and edge set calligraphic E. And uh, let us give ourselves a, new, a prime. We, we fix some prime P, P, J, a new prime. So it's not one of the primes I have already used in the previous steps for which I have full information. And here's what we do. We want to now focus on a subgraph of GJ, of GJ minus 1, for which we have full information. So, and what are the candidate subgraphs? We look, we, what we do is to split the left and right vertex sets into four subsets, uh, into two subsets, each one, which we call VP, VP hat, WGP, WP hat. So everything here is divisible by P and everything here is not divisible by P. Uh, and the same, uh, the same here. Okay, so where are my edges? The edges go like that, they go like that, they go like that, and they go like that. <clears throat> okay, so I have four possibilities, and I would like to choose G, J to be one of these four possibilities. And in all possibilities are good because in every possibility I have full information with respect to my prime, my new prime P. Okay, so, um, how do I choose? Um, I, I need to first understand some qualitative features of this graph. What happens if I move to this graph, to this graph, to this graph, or to this graph? So let me examine that. Let's consider first the case where we move to the graph, um, to this one, to the top graph. Okay, so what happens in the top graph? In the top graph, everything is divisible by P. Uh, this means I can think of recalibrating my vertices if I want to, and, by, and dividing through by P on the left and on the right. So this uh, reduces the size of the vertices by a factor of P, which is good because I have smaller, a uh, smaller thing, I can bound it better. But on the other hand, uh, it also reduces this condition by a factor of P when I divide through by P, the GCD condition I have, and this condition is, allowing, is, is a 
is what also helps me to uh, prove my graph is, uh, my, my edge set is not too big, but now this condition gets weakened by a factor of p. So, uh, let, right, so let me, so here I have gain in the, vert, in the v side, I have gain in the, in the w side, and I have a loss in the GCD side. Okay, so what is the gain in V? It is a factor of P. And the factor of P in W, but also I lose a factor of P. So I'm a completely, I'm in a completely balanced situation. What about the other, the top, uh, the bottom one, sorry? This is also a balanced situation. Nothing is divisible by P here, so no gains nor loss, nor any losses. But what about the diagonal cases, the asymmetric cases? What if I look at VP? WP check. Well, the p var the, the the v vertices are divisible by p now, so I do gain a factor of p. But the w ones are not, so I don't gain there anything. But also the GCDs are not, uh, because they must divide w, which is not divisible by p. So the GCDs are also not divisible by p. So here I don't have a loss either. And this is a good situation, which is not balanced. I actually gain a factor of p in, uh, in total. And the same is true for the other uh, asymmetric case. Have one, p one here. So in these two cases, it's really good because my uh, sort of my sort of size, um, my size is bet is better by a factor of p, and this means uh, I can afford to lose a lot, a lot of edges. I can afford to lose to, to to go from e edges to one over p times e edges, basically, in these cases. Uh, so from this, um, so uh, motivated by this discussion, so here's how we actually define the quality. We look at the, or rather, I, it's, better, it's easier to tell you how is the ratio uh, of consecutive qualities, right? So it's going to look like um, it's going to be, uh, I have the ratio of edge sets. Okay, so this means that uh, my quality uh, tells me controls the, the edge sets, which is good. We wanted that. Uh, we have a technical factor, sort of inspired by Roth, which this, the delta J is the edge density of my graph. So this is a technical factor that we need to put in to make the argument work. And we also have this extra factor this, uh, that captures the GCD structure. So the factor is 1 or P, PJ. Uh, and it's one if in is the symmetric cases, and uh, in PJ if in asymmetric cases. Okay, so this is the graph. Uh, this is the quality we we'll work with, and uh, what we want to show, what we actually show is that uh, the goal is to show that we can foc we can always choose one of the subgraphs for which one of these quantities has increased. And uh, this is the goal, and this is what we would like to prove. But there is a catch here. Uh, the model problem, as I stated it, is actually not true. And this is due to an example, a counterexample found by Sam Chow. Uh, it is actually not possible to show that this quality always increases um, at every step of the way. Uh, and the reason is that there is a case um, that uh, we can only guarantee increase in quality. Sorry, we only have. Uh, we lose a factor of 1 minus 1 over p quantity squared in the top uh, case. So instead of growing by one, by at least 1, we drop a little bit. Uh, and the, what saves us and what uh, allows the proof of the Duffy cipher to go through is that the vertices are actually, we don't have actually cardinalities here, but because of how the Duffy cipher conjecture is stated, the vertices are naturally stated, uh, weighted by phi v over v and phi w over w that have the same 1 minus 1 over p factor in them uh, twice, and then this completely counteracts the loss in quality here. So if you build this into the quality, you can make the argument uh, go through and complete the proof, uh, the quality agreement argument, and that's the proof of the duffy Schaefer conjecture. Thank you for, the, for your attention. Thank you for watching my talk. OK, so. Um, thanks very much, uh, Professor Kokolopoulos, for the wonderful talk.
and uh, and thank you for joining us for um for this session of the virtual ICM. Um, there's one more talk uh, left uh, in this room two, uh, which will commence uh, in 15 minutes time. Okay, so see you there. Thank you.